The market for video games is currently thriving. Superdata Research estimated that the revenue of the global video games industry was around $159.3 billion in the year 2020. By comparison, the revenue of the global music industry was valued at $19.1 billion, and the global film industry was valued at $41.7 billion, which means that the market for video games was 2.5 times larger in 2020 than music and cinema put together. Fun fact, in 2020, Animal Crossing New Horizons made $2 billion in revenue alone. That's right, Animal Crossing was worth a little over one-tenth of the entirety of music. The 2023 Quarter 3 forecasts for the global games market shows a projected revenue of $187.7 billion, a substantial increase over even pandemic numbers when everyone was inside playing games. In August of 2023, GamesIndustry.biz reported that supply issues for new generation hardware had stabilized, and that video game hardware sales had increased by a whopping 19% when compared to spending just a year prior. And Statista reports a revenue growth for the video games industry of nearly 12% in 2023, and projects an annual revenue growth rate of nearly 10% for each of the years between 2023 and 2027. In light of all of these optimistic reports about the video games industry, why then are we seeing so many layoffs and game dev studio closures? GamesIndustry.biz reports that over 80 gaming companies and gaming-related media sites have been hit with substantial layoffs this year, including some of the biggest names in the industry, such as Naughty Dog, Epic Games, Blizzard, Roblox, Gearbox, BioWare, CD Projekt Red, Embracer Group, Ubisoft, Take-Two Interactive, EA, NetEase, and Riot. We saw Unity, developers of the Unity game engine, Fracture. We saw Volition, creators of the Saints Row franchise, bite the bullet. Videogameslayoffs.com estimates that the industry has laid off an estimated 7,800 employees as of November 16th, 2023. The entire industry looks like it's on the brink of collapse. But why? Why is this happening? If the market for video games is better than ever, if the demand is greater than ever before, then why does it seem like the video games industry is collapsing? Shouldn't it be thriving? Isn't this basic market economics? Understanding what's really going on here requires putting together many separate pieces of a much larger puzzle. Is the video games industry collapsing? Well, no, at least not all of it is. For most of the industry, the layoffs, the closures, the failures, these are by design and are a reflection of a new way of doing business that has completely infected the industry. But first, if the highly illogical nature of the video games industry has you feeling a little spacey, why not check out today's sponsor Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is a free-to-play 4X open-world MMO set in one of my personal favorite sci-fi universes, Star Trek. Explore the game's immersive starscapes, ogle at the incredible graphics, engage in epic battles with players all over the world, and step into the shoes of your favorite Starfleet officers like Captain Kirk or Mr. Spock. Build your favorite Star Trek ships like the USS Enterprise or the Romulan Warbird. Forge alliances with a thriving community of real players and command your own starbase on the very edge of civilized space as you experience the captivating storyline of the Kelvin timeline. With Star Trek Fleet Command's fifth year anniversary now underway, there's never been a better time to start. Download Star Trek Fleet Command using the link in my description or the provided QR code. Go to your in-game profile, open your settings, and sign up for a Scopely account. From there, go to StarTrekFleetCommand.com and click Store to access your new Scopely account. And finally, once you are in the store, access your promo codes on the left-hand side of the menu and enter the code WARPSPEED to redeem your reward. Just remember the code is for new players only. Explore strange new worlds, seek out new life and new civilizations, and boldly go where no man has gone before in Star Trek Fleet Command. A very special thank you to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. If you take a close look at the CEOs of many of your favorite video game companies, you might notice something interesting. A lot of video game CEOs are emulating in their presentation in their choice of language the characteristics of the most successful CEOs in the wider tech industry. 
Oh, but everyone's doing that, right? Everyone wants to learn from success, after all, and tech is where the success is. All right, you got me there, Sundar, fair point. But not every industry is like the tech industry, and tech itself is a big amorphous blob. Tech can mean a company like Apple, which is about 20% development, 30% marketing, and 50% religious cult. In other words, a company that produces a very specific style of product and relies on clever marketing and social manipulation to push that product. Tech can also mean a company like PayPal, which is the realm of fintech, financial technology. PayPal is not at all like Apple, but we don't really hesitate to call either one a tech company. Can you see where I'm going with this? If you want to emulate a successful CEO and you want to sell a video game, whom do you emulate? Do you emulate the guy who sells phones or the guy who sells loans? Which makes more sense? Well, naturally, the phone guy, right? You emulate Steve Jobs and you become Todd Howard. It just works seamlessly. It really works. And it really works. It works perfectly. That just works really, really well. And one of the great things about having a fully dynamic game engine is all of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. Extrapolate this out now one step further. If you are corporate leadership, which keep in mind often involves far more than just a single person in the CEO, and you want to emulate the governance of a successful company, which company do you choose to emulate and how? And what happens when your choice of emulation turns out to be the wrong fit, or turns out to be wrong in execution? Well, for years and years now, the video games industry, particularly in the West, which is to say not Japan or China or South Korea for the most part, has modeled itself after the biggest players in the tech industry, just as how video game CEOs often model their styles after successful tech CEOs. This shouldn't be news to anyone. Why one of the traditional big three companies of the video games industry is Microsoft, a company which needs no introduction. Okay, but video games are tech, so it makes sense if video game company leadership acts like big tech company leadership, right? Well, not necessarily. Remember the Apple and PayPal comparison. Making a great video game, controlling your creative branding, marketing your product, achieving sales figures. These are things that work very differently for a video game company than they do for, say, Netflix, Samsung, or Oracle. But I digress. The video games industry emulating the tech industry is not just limited to Todd Howard adopting the mannerisms of Steve Jobs. We've also seen the internal corporate structure of video game companies change to become structured more like those of big tech companies. And perhaps more relevantly here, we've seen video game companies develop their financial strategies in the direction of big tech as well. I'll go into more detail on this point later in the video, but for now let's do some Finance 101. Let's say you start a video game company. What's the purpose of your company? You've heard me ask this before, right? You might start with the intention of making the best video games possible, but as the company grows, your business purpose de facto becomes make profit and grow. The company must grow because it has obligations to suppliers and clients and customers and potentially investors or even shareholders. If the company fails to grow, if it stagnates, it becomes unable to pay its workers better wages that experience demands. It becomes unable to fulfill its obligations to suppliers or produce novel new products for customers. To stagnate is to shrink and to shrink is to die. How then do you optimize and ideally maximize your growth? You can choose to focus on making the best games possible and every video game company pays lip service to that intention. But that's very hard and nobody can do that homework for you. You can bring on the best talent and have the most demanding standards, but so what? As we will see later in the video, having the best sales and the best games does not mean you have the most profitable, nor the most valuable, nor the fastest growing company. The much easier way to maximize growth is to focus on your investors, your shareholders. A game plan that you don't have to reinvent, merely copy. In almost no sector of the market has mastered the art of buttering up investors quite like that of tech. Growth, you see, is a term that is exactly as unclear as it sounds. Your company needs to grow, but what does grow mean? Finance isn't law. The definitions are often not logical, but sentimental. Investopedia defines growth as an expansion, making the company bigger, increasing its market, and ultimately making it more profitable. But how exactly does one measure the increase in one's market share or the size of one's company? Well, you can try to do so by looking at specific numbers, which are indicators of those larger concepts. Your company is growing in size if you have more employees, more offices, more sales. 
Your company is healthier, or at least investors think so, if your share price is up, or if your P.E. ratio, your price to earnings ratio, looks a certain way relative to your beta, your volatility, etc. Now, we won't get into the nitty gritty, you're not here for that stuff, and quite frankly, most investors don't actually care about all that stuff either. In fact, as long as investors see that your company has more employees and more offices and more sales and a higher share price, etc., they will continue to invest. It doesn't actually matter how well the company is doing, it only matters how the company looks to other investors. And as an investor, as long as there are bigger suckers than you, you can always make a profit. You might have heard this dynamic called the greater fool theory. You can even inflate some of those statistics when times are good by using techniques like stock buybacks so as to give the appearance of extraordinary results. In fact, if you don't inflate your numbers when everyone else is inflating theirs, you might even look like you are falling behind or being unsophisticated and thereby incompetent. If investors think your company has the potential to grow, then you will continue to grow even if you aren't actually making any money or doing anything. But you must give the appearance that you are doing something right, that money somehow is being or will be made. Now, don't get me wrong, making actual money and doing actual stuff helps, but it isn't required for growth. As long as capital is coming in and building the pyramid up, the scheme continues. In any case, now that you know the fundamentals, it's time to talk about tech financing more directly. To summarize quickly what we have so far, video games and the tech sector are not just related, they are conjoined. Video games are a kind of tech, sure, but the video games industry, particularly in the West, has made itself a facsimile of the wider big tech industry copying the game plan of the most successful players in that wider tech industry at times without understanding the mechanisms behind those decisions. But what is this game plan exactly? Well, the modern big tech financing game plan, emphasis on the big, comes to us from the crucible of the dot-com bubble. It's a very recent twist. You generate hype, you get investors on board, you use the capital to expand rapidly, even if that expansion is merely for appearances, so that you can push the wave of enthusiasm and investors as far as it goes, and thereby maximize your capital inflow during the hype boom time. Then, as the enthusiasm reaches and peaks and begins to fade away, you will have hopefully stashed a substantial pile of ever-growing cash, which you are then supposed to use to cushion the short period of financial hurt that occurs as the tide retreats. You then announce some harmless restructuring, or more recently, you announce layoffs. And if you're devious, you can even use those layoffs to cut out expensive loose ends, maybe. And in so doing, you make it look like the company is cutting its excesses. The very excesses that you will recall you purposefully engaged in in order to show extraordinary growth during the hype cycle. This gives the appearance of corporate mindfulness, which stabilizes your share price and boosts investor confidence, which you can then slowly spin towards the next investor hype cycle. This up and down movement is called a boom bust cycle, and this is nothing controversial, this is how markets work. However, not every boom-bust cycle is natural, and the peak of the boom and the bottom of the bust can be and are manipulated to maximize profit and minimize loss in very cynical ways. Don't take my word for it. Google's latest financial report shows that Alphabet has around $120 billion in cash just lying around. It participated in the COVID tech hype cycle as all savvy tech companies did. Google expanded massively, was hiring like crazy, was boosting that COVID hype as far as possible, and it paid big dividends for them. When people realized that the COVID quarantine period wasn't going to be forever and that lives would eventually return to normal, the hype cycle died, and we saw Alphabet stock drop from its peak around $150 a share to as low as $92 a share. Then, here comes responsible Alphabet, cutting jobs en masse for the first time since the Great Recession, which stabilizes the price. Finally, the new hype train arrives in the form of AI and inflows the capital. The next push hasn't even started in earnest yet. We should expect that to arrive. Uh, wait, what is this? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the 2018 cycle repetition here. Let me jump to 2023. Ah, uh, here we go. Now, to be fair, this doesn't always work out, even for the big dogs. You may recall that Facebook tried to push its hype cycle into overdrive with the metaverse change, but messed up its timing and smacked face first into the floor. Mark knows how to play ball, though, and he knows that a single mistake isn't a deadly one if you know how the plan works. You need the cash pillow to weather the tide going out and to cushion any mistakes you might make. And then you need to just wait it out until the next hype cycle train and meta hit the AI hype cycle train timing perfectly. 
Mooney, I can hear you say, isn't this all a little cynical? An easier explanation is surely that COVID created large demand for tech services because we were indoors and then suddenly we weren't indoors and now they're too big and need to downsize. Or that Apple and Meta and all these tech companies utilize rolling debt financing wherein one borrows hundreds of millions of dollars and has to pay down the debt and rising interest rates caused that debt to be untenable and thus put these companies at risk of defaulting on their loans if they don't downsize. Well, as to the former point, what does too big mean? What are we downsizing for? Alphabet and Apple and companies like them are constantly complaining about not having enough employees. This hiring trend didn't start with COVID. The hiring boom in tech is a process that has been ongoing for the past decade. The layoffs for investor sentiment are a relatively new development, which is either Facebook or Microsoft's fault, depending on who you ask. And it is proven to be a more successful way to influence investor sentiment versus the old strategy of merely reorganizing and moving staff around. Concerning the influencing of investors on the hype cycle, well, the hype cycle is an observable phenomenon both inside and outside of tech and finance. Information technology company Gartner publishes something called the Gartner Hype Cycle for Emerging Technologies. You can see that hype cycles for real-life tech applicability have these very same ebbs and flows. If a company can swim into the peak to push the peak of the hype higher and resist the trough reducing the bottom of the cycle, a company can maximize its profitability during that cycle rotation. As to the latter, concerning rolling debt financing, well, as we saw, Alphabet has $120 billion in cash. It is not defaulting on its loans anytime soon. And you know it wouldn't be one of my videos if we didn't dig a little deeper. Alphabet publishes investor reports where it tells you exactly what its liabilities are. Alphabet's revenue, that is money coming in, increased substantially in 2023 when compared to the same time last year in 2022. And while Alphabet's liabilities have gone up, the cost of their long-term debt has actually decreased, and in fact a lot of the increase in liabilities is due to, and I quote, reductions in our workforce and office space, which resulted in employee severance and related charges of over $2.1 billion. It costs money to excessively hire and cynically fire, but it brings in more from investors than it does in damage. And now here's the caveat. What if you are a copycat CEO or a copycat board and you decide you want to follow Alphabet's example or Meta's example or even Microsoft's example, but you don't know the game plan? What happens if you try to copy the dance but you don't actually know the steps? Well, the answer is... You trip. A lot of tech startups make it big by figuring out how to correctly hook into the hype cycle. They offer some new promising product or technology or way of doing business and they manage to get investors interested enough that capital cascades upon capital and before long, a unicorn is born. But being a master manipulator is only half the battle. This is a three-step dance and you must complete all three steps. Step one is to swim into the hype to accumulate capital. Step two is to swim against the trough holding onto some of that capital to weather the hype fading. And step three is to hype again and swim into the new hype, richer than you were the last time. Having some actual sales and profits is nice too, but not strictly necessary. The tech company Palantir, please don't hurt me, has a PE ratio of 328 as of November 2023. What is a PE ratio? Well, a PE ratio or a price to earnings ratio is a company's share price relative to its earnings per share. In other words, it measures how much one share costs relative to how much the company actually earns per that one share. Palantir's PE ratio of 328 means that its average share price is 328 times higher than how much it made in earnings per share. Palantir's current share price is $19.20. This gives us an earnings per share of roughly six cents. Palantir earned only six cents per share in the previous four quarters, even though the stock costs over $20 a share. Amazon, despite how much business it does, has a PE ratio of 76.61. To give you a comparison, Ford Motor Company has a P.E. ratio of 6.8, and Sega Sammy Holdings has a P.E. ratio of 7.37. So yes, making something helps even if that something is like 80% for appearances. What matters more for this strategy is hooking into the hype cycle. But once you have hooked into the hype cycle, you must know when the cycle has peaked so that you can prepare to swim the other way and cut. This means having a war chest and having room to lay off such that you aren't cutting crucial staff for appearances sake or worse. Cutting crucial staff because you genuinely don't have capital left to retain them. 
if you push one rotation of the hype cycle too far and just keep pushing the grow button hoping the investor hype never ends, you are not copying big tech, you are copying cancer. And at some point, the investors will die, and so too will your company. Apologies in advance to all the Wall Street bets folks I'm about to trigger, but your company will end up like WeWork. A once up-and-coming tech darling, which quoting The Guardian, didn't belong to any predetermined boom-and-bust model, and wound up exploding, going from a stock price of around $500 a share in spring of 2021 to a price today of $1.25 a share. Or, for that matter, Peloton, which messed up both the cutting part and the hype cycle follow-through and saw its share price fall from around $150 a share in December of 2021 to $5.27 a share as of November 17th, 2023. Wait, I hear you say? So you're saying that you don't actually need to make anything, right? Microsoft is just buying all these studios for the hype and not to make any actual games. Is that what you're saying, Mooney? No. Making the games and having them be successful is a part of the hype cycle, and it can be a big driver. Of course you want to have actual revenue to show your investors. But consider the P.E. ratios I just discussed. As long as the investor believes you are growing and doing great, how much you are actually earning is far less relevant. But it's not irrelevant. And likewise, how much you are actually earning is also less relevant to your decisions to cut or spend than the whims of your investors. As such, as we will see, one could be making record sales revenue, but still be cutting staff. If this is what will maximize capital inflow in accordance with the cycle. Now, of course, this is all a vast simplification. I don't have a semester to teach you, just a YouTube video, so this is the best that we can do together. Nonetheless, you've reached level two, so don't forget to update your character sheets. It's time to apply our understanding of how big tech operates to the video games industry more specifically and elevate the nuance a little bit. We're seeing layoffs and studio closures and shoddy game releases and more, but it's important to note that not every occurrence of layoffs or bad game releases or studio closures is happening for the same reason. The layoffs at Humble, for example, are not coming from the same place as the layoffs at EA Games. And the so-called crisis at Embracer Group is not the same as the crisis at Unity. However, all of these different troubles, we'll call them, start at the same starting line, which is how these companies engaged with the big tech hype cycle and how they all copied the same game plans to varying effect. In order to give you perspective on the troubles in the video games industry right now, I'm going to break down as many of these different troubles as I can into three broad categories. Category number one is business as usual. These companies know the steps and are dancing the dance. They might be copying the big players, but they've at least figured out how the dance is done. They are in the green. They are not subject to major impending crises, and it is very likely that this process of excess hiring and layoffs was intentional, something that I will prove to you by showing you their investor reports. In this case, the layoffs are a cynical business decision. It's cruel, maybe, but it's business, and this is how the game is played. Number two is overbooming. These organizations tried to copy the dance but haven't mastered the steps. Many of them are emulating the behaviors of Microsoft and Sony, and these companies and developers hit the hype cycle but tried to push the hype too far and are reworking themselves to death. At some point, you have to start accumulating capital from the hype so that you can store it and use it to defend yourself. If you just keep reinvesting the capital back into the hype as the hype peaks and rolls over, your reinvestment meets diminishing returns until you starve. These companies didn't prepare for winter, and now they are in crisis. And finally, number three, external factors. Now, these companies, like all the others, are subject to the same trends as everyone else, and they might be downsizing or reorganizing for external factors that are beyond merely copying big tech business strategy. Now, before we break down each situation and look into the facts more directly, let's put together a contextual timeline because understanding the timeline will help us to get a better sense of how aware of the curve each video game company has been. In July of 2022, Microsoft announced that it would lay off a little under 1% of its total workforce and that it would significantly slow its recruitment in the face of a potential upcoming recession. One by one, tech companies both in the gaming space and in the wider tech space began also preparing for the trough of the cycle. ByteDance, for example, Zijie Tiaodong, the company behind Douyin TikTok, aggressively downsized its gaming operations as early as September of 2022. 
However, a lot of the Chinese downsizing and cutting that was occurring at the time, not just at ByteDance, but at MiHoYo, creators of Genshin and Honkai, was due not only to a foreseeable turning of the cycle, but because the Chinese government was cracking down on gaming at the time, making these earlier Chinese examples perhaps more of a number three. One very early player in the layoffs game was a games developer who arguably jumped the gun on the turning over, but better to jump the gun on the hype cycle than to overstay your welcome. That developer was Jam City, who in August of 2022 laid off 17% of its staff, estimated to be hundreds of employees across the company. Most of those layoffs took place within their subsidiary studio Ludia, makers of the mobile game Jurassic World Alive. Jam City's spokesperson stated that the decision was, and I quote, a necessary move to enhance our flexibility and increase operating efficiencies, better positioning Jam City for long-term growth. Just a year prior, in September of 2021, Jam City acquired Ludia for $165 million, financed as it was by a funding round of $350 million. The company also abandoned its plans to go public despite having a $1.2 billion valuation in summer of 2021 due to what they called current market conditions. And this occurred while a lot of other companies were still in their hype cycles. This company knows the steps of the dance and it has danced very elegantly indeed. This is an example of a conservative, safer approach to number one, business as usual. No brinkmanship to squeeze the gains here. They left the hype cycle early, and I suspect we will be seeing more of Jam City in the future. The larger tech industry layoffs that occurred thereafter included Comcast, who shut down G4 TV just one year after G4's relaunch. Keep that one year number in mind, the same one we saw with Jam City. It's going to come up quite a few times as we continue. By late 2022, the layoffs were in full swing. We saw DocuSign and Intel and Oracle all conduct layoffs. Meta announced on November 9th, 2022 that it would be cutting 13% of its staff. Layoffs that may genuinely have been worse than they should have been in fulfillment of the game plan because of, well, Meta. That hype phase misstep there. They tried to push the cycle too hard in the wrong direction just as it was cresting, and instead of squeezing more out of the cycle, they tripped. But, well, Meta has plenty of reserves and plenty of excess employees to selectively let go and it was able to recover without issue and correctly play into the next hype cycle without excessive damage. Stripe, Twitter, Salesforce, Amazon, Cisco, HP, and many other large tech companies also conducted layoffs in November, and Amazon in particular had a second, even larger round of layoffs in December into January. They are the most cynical of anyone. Alphabet, which is to say Google, Microsoft, and IBM conducted major layoffs in January of 2023. And PayPal, Zoom, Dell, GitHub, Yahoo, and Twitter announced more cuts and layoffs moving into February of 2023. The axing by larger companies slowed through the summer, and while layoffs are still happening, the massive, system-shocking layoffs appear to be done for now. What does this tell us? Well, we can get a better sense of who is privy to the game and who is merely copycatting by seeing when they decided to execute their own layoffs. We can then use their place on the timeline to help us contextualize their actual business decision making to see where in the chart to put them. If a company engaged in its layoffs before the big players did, or during the same relative period, which is to say mid-2022 to early 2023, we have some evidence that they are dancing the steps properly. Jam City, for example, was in front of the curve and stated in no unclear terms that they knew the rules of the game. Microsoft and Amazon and Meta and Google might be cynical in how they've done layoffs, but they are the game makers. This current dance that everybody is dancing is one that they invented, so they are all in category one as well. As we will see though, not every company is privy to the steps and many of them were late to the party with the cuts having first overboomed. Although this style of decision making is reactionary by nature, their late realization of the changing meta means that they threw away good capital in an attempt to lure non-existent investors thus causing the pyramid below to become unstable, necessitating measures that are genuinely detrimental to the long-term health of their companies. With even more context in mind now, let's finally start going through the timeline, contextualizing some of the layoffs or closures, and placing them as we go along into one of our three categories. I'll be primarily looking at game developers, but we will dip into games media and some other relevant organizations as well. Once we've analyzed enough of these case studies, we can determine together if the video games industry is collapsing, or if this is just the industry adopting the cynical corporate governance strategies of big tech while leaving behind the old ways. A topic which we'll get to later in the video. 
Now, I can't go over every single instance of layoffs for the sake of brevity, but once you understand how to read the information, you should be able to figure out where the other companies fit on the chart yourself. Layoff information is pulled from VideoGamesLayoffs.com and information on studio closures has been pulled largely from GamesIndustry.biz. In any case, here we go, starting with the layoffs. 2023's first instance of layoffs occurred with Wizards of the Coast, laying off around 15 employees on January 3rd. Wizards of the Coast is a super complicated situation, one that maybe warrants its own video, perhaps. I'll summarize though as best as I can. You might recall that Wizards of the Coast ran into issues earlier this year concerning its open game license, the OGL. Well, that decision requires a little background itself. Wizards of the Coast is the company that publishes Magic the Gathering and owns Dungeons and Dragons. Wizards was acquired by Hasbro in 1999 and despite being treated at times like a forgotten subsidiary, Wizards was responsible for nearly half of Hasbro's revenue as of early 2022. The alleged mismanagement of Wizards and the potential lost profitability for Hasbro became a point of contention for shareholders, who, led by AltaFox Capital Management, led an attempted coup against Hasbro's board of directors. AltaFox's demands were that Hasbro spin off its Wizards of the Coast digital gaming unit and better manage its allocation of capital. In what way? Well, AltaFox wanted Hasbro to get with the modern program, spend money to make money. Hasbro, meanwhile, defended those allegations by stating that this strategy was unlikely to create any value for the company. The coup was defeated on June 8, 2022, and shareholders re-elected the company's directors. The concerns of the activist investors, though, still had to be addressed, and so the board went ahead and pushed forward with some incredibly underbaked schemes to wrangle more money out of Wizards of the Coast. They decided to dance the dance without knowing the steps, but in an almost preposterously short-sighted way, the fallout of which you might already be familiar with. Now, don't quote me on this, but the move might have even been stupid on purpose. A matter of corporate politics. You reduce the support for AltaFox's position even further by conceding to their plan in the dumbest way possible so that you can point to it and say, look, it was an idiotic idea. In any case, this is why somehow, despite greater interest in Dungeons & Dragons than ever before, despite the incredible success of Baldur's Gate 3 as an ostensible game of the year contender, Hasbro has not only failed to capitalize in any meaningful way, they've eaten dirt. And their stock price is down 23% this year as of November 21st, 2023. Wizards of the Coast belongs in Category 2. Moving on, we have Unity Technologies, uh, two really complicated stories back-to-back -back, Unity and Wizards. I'll have a video specifically about Unity coming out eventually. But to make another long story short, Unity's leadership is an absolutely prime textbook example of dancing the dance without understanding the steps. I'll disclose that I have a bit of personal stake in this whole debacle, and so I need to speak a little carefully here. Unity is a situation in which the enthusiasm into the boom cycle was pushed way too far. The future video will go into more detail on this, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Epic Games, which runs the Epic Store, makes the complicated Unreal Engine and handles the marketing for and development of games like Fortnite, has around 3,700 employees. And keep in mind, they also participate in this hype spending and hiring. Unity in 2022 had over 7,700 employees, nearly double that of Epic, a substantially larger and more complicated company. Unity was also pushing hot into acquisitions and into the peak of the hype cycle at a time when, you will recall, big tech companies around it were already beginning layoffs. In January of 2022, Unity announced an acquisition of Ziva Dynamics, a VFX company. In March of 2022, Unity announced a partnership with Insomniac to create interactive online concerts and events. In July of 2022, Unity agreed to purchase Iron Source in an all-stock deal worth $4.4 billion, a decision that was a complete head-scratcher for many game devs at the time, but one that makes perfect sense if you're an overzealous board. At around the same time in August of 2022, Unity turned down an offer by App Lovin to buy Unity in exchange for $17.54 billion in an all-stock deal, which Unity rejected. At this time, Unity was already hemorrhaging money and was trying to push the hype cycle further in hopes that this time it would be able to crest the peak and store the capital it needed to work into the next cycle. But it failed extremely critically, and in its failure it decided to go with the tried and true route of desperately squeezing blood from a stone. 
the very same foolishness we saw emerge from wizards just now, built from the very same mistakes, and potentially also just as intentionally. I'll talk more about the individual actors in this story in a future video, uh, but don't blame former CEO John Ricciitiel too much. He's actually a rather conservative presence, little c here, I mean. He was, or was supposed to be, the moderating presence. If one can fault him for anything, it's that he didn't successfully rein in the other actors. It's complicated, we'll save that discussion for another video. Unity goes into Category 2, two shining perfect examples in Cat 2 so far. Next up, we have Microsoft's Studios in 343, The Coalition, and Bethesda. Microsoft's fiscal year 2024 quarter one earnings release published on October 24th, 2023 shows us that Xbox content and services revenue increased 13%, and that Microsoft returned $9.1 billion to shareholders in the form of share repurchases, aka buybacks, and dividends in the first quarter of fiscal year 2024. Microsoft's net income in 2022 was $17,556,000,000, and Microsoft Gaming is generally fine. It's better than fine, even. It's doing great. But individual studios, which are given a lot more leeway to act independently by Microsoft, do not necessarily reflect Microsoft as a whole, which makes this all a little bit more complicated. In the game dev studio world, in the video games industry writ large, if you're going to copy big tech, one of the ideal companies to copy is Microsoft. You might look at Microsoft and say, oh, Xbox is third place in the race, and they're doing the worst of the big three. But Microsoft's video games presence is far, far greater than just Xbox, and it is their strategy of acquisitions and masterful play of the hype boom bust cycle that makes Microsoft a winner worth copying for many of the other players in the industry. Microsoft was amongst the first to start the current trend of mass acquisition during the hype part of the cycle. Microsoft is also one of the best tech hype cycle dancers in the world. It's arguably the best at it. And the results speak for themselves. Microsoft's studios include such industry greats as 343, The Coalition, Double Fine, Ninja Theory, Obsidian, Rare, Playground, and even Mojang. Let's not forget that Microsoft also owns ZeniMax, which includes Bethesda, Arcane, id, Machine Games, and more. And of course, Microsoft has now acquired Activision Blizzard, albeit only after a much longer than anticipated struggle. Microsoft announced its intent to acquire Activision Blizzard in January 18th of 2022, which fits our timeline nicely. But trouble from regulators and some dirty fighting by Sony caused the deal to close as late as October 13th, 2023. Microsoft wouldn't have preferred that date for sure, but it doesn't matter. Microsoft can cushion the blow because it's played the previous hype cycles so well, and now it will sit on the down low until the next cycle comes around, at which point we will likely see the former ATVI join the hype push in a big way. Fingers crossed for a Heroes of the Storm revival. However, despite Microsoft and thereby all of its subsidiaries being a Category 1, it is important to note that this doesn't always mean that these subsidiaries survive. Superfluous acquisitions are made so that cuts can be made, but the hires and cuts and reorgs aren't always the same people. In fact, they rarely are. If you dance right, you aren't hiring the perfect amount and not cutting. You are always hiring excess when times are good and moving excess around when times are bad, even if that might apparently cost you much more, because number one, it cynically feeds into the hype and responsibility cycle that drives investor sentiments, and number two, it requires less fine-tuning and thus leaves less room for error. As such, if a subsidiary studio gets closed and its employees get laid off, this doesn't mean that the studio belongs in Category 2. This is just Category 1, but from a larger scale. Bigger organization means greater cuts are necessary to achieve the same effect. Moving on, when Riot announced layoffs in January of 2023, a lot of people scratched their heads. Riot seems to be doing better than ever and their results throughout the rest of the year seems to have corroborated those thoughts. Just recently, LOL Worlds 2023 shattered records as the most viewed esports event ever, even as the rest of the industry bemoans the apparent death of esports. One might conjecture that these layoffs warrant a potential Category 3 placement given some shifts in Chinese economics and crackdowns, and Riot being a subsidiary of Tencent. But those Category 3 layoffs at Tencent had already occurred as early as June of 2022, which was also when other Chinese companies like Alibaba and Xiaohongsu conducted their own layoffs. Tencent conducted its own Category 1 layoffs in February of 2023, which also tracks with the general trend. And as such, 
the minor relatively small layoffs at Riot are consistent with Tencent's overarching strategy. This is a Category 1, cynical business as usual. Now, this is an interesting case study as Hi-Rez, creator of Smite, is not like the other parties we've discussed so far. Hi-Rez is a privately owned company. As such, information like the company's corporate governance strategies are, well, private. Hi-Rez had two rounds of layoffs, one ostensibly in January of an unknown number of people, and another round in June of about 30 people. It's tough to place Hi-Rez in a category because this entity might not even know it's in the middle of a dance, it might just be riding the tides. If it does know, it hasn't shared it in a meaningful way. However, given the stagnation of Hi-Rez's top product in Smite, its internal corporate restructuring, and two rounds of layoffs, I'm inclined to put Hi-Rez in Category 2, but noting that this could also be a Category 3. A lot of the indies and mid-sized private studios are going to be in this Category 2, maybe Category 3 range. Many of them don't even understand they're emulating the same battle plan everyone else is. At best, they're blindly copying what everyone else is doing, hence Category 2, or at worst, drowning for some other reason, thus Category 3. As such, I won't discuss too many more of these indies or private studios. Just put most of them in the same box as high res and you'd be about right. Next up is Electronic Arts, and EA is going to be a big, interesting case study. Because you see, EA knows the dance very well, and they are one of the most savvy and cynical players in the game. In January, we saw EA cancel Apex Legends Mobile and Battlefield Mobile with associated firing of over 200 Q&A staff. It also shuttered its industry toys studio then. In January as well, EA subsidiary Respawn Entertainment saw layoffs which were then followed by a very large round of layoffs at EA proper in March, wherein EA laid off 6% of its workforce while CEO Andrew Wilson simultaneously stated that EA is operating from a position of strength. Further layoffs thereafter occurred in June at EA subsidiary Fire Monkeys and in August at BioWare. EA is extremely interesting because they don't beat around the bush very much. In EA's 2022 annual investor report, it states that one of its key strategic and operating objectives for that fiscal year was the creation of the most innovative games and content. It noted that it launched nine major titles and achieved its target. Now, Electronic Arts is what we call a fiscal year taxpayer, which means that for accounting purposes, its year begins on October 1st and runs to September 30th of the next year. And so EA's 2022 annual investor report reflects the period from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022, which you will recall was towards the end of the boom cycle and not deep into the bust cycle. So during the boom cycle, EA still cares a lot about its game releases and its hype. Zoomed out, here are all the priorities from mid-2021 to mid-2022. Games, services, audiences, people slash employees. Well, what does the same priorities list look like in 2022 compared to 2023? Well, instead of games, services, audiences, and people, we have strategy, content, social ecosystems, aggregation slash distribution, talent, and culture slash work. Strategy is defined as align the company behind our strategic pillars, including portfolio plans, financial models, and clear points of integration with functional and franchise strategies. Let me translate that for you. It's time to switch steps in the dance. Hype cycles over, time for the trough, to which they feel they slightly missed the target. In the amazing content and experiences section, there is no comment on game releases, merely player engagement and progress on tools. Pulling back on the hype, preparing the tools necessary for the push into the next cycle. The social ecosystems section corroborates that. Lots of developing and testing platforms and again, tools for the next cycle. The same goes for aggregation and distribution. But what about talent? What about employees? Well, despite all the layoffs, EA states that it has exceeded its target of attracting and retaining talent. Clear as day, right? No obfuscation whatsoever. EA knows the steps of the dance cold. They may have slipped a tiny bit by their own admission, but they're doing everything by the book. This is a clear category one. There are a few other big companies who are ostensibly in this EA Microsoft box and have followed similar business logic, but with a very different execution. Embracer, Take-Two, and Ubisoft are all large competent entities, but there are some caveats concerning their layoff cycles. For example, Embracer Group, I'm going to argue, is a Category 2. It had some minor layoffs and slowed acquisitions this year, which seems to reflect an awareness of the plan. 
but it also over-acquired, which is a misstep that the less experienced players make. You recall Embracer was acquiring apparently everything for a time. Corporate finance advisory firm Drakestar in its 2022 Global Gaming Report stated that Embracer made more than 20 acquisitions in 2022 valued at over $1 billion. Embracer was making acquisitions even as the most experienced players were making their cuts into the downtrend like Microsoft or Electronic Arts. And that overboom and unawareness of the cycle turning over spooked a very important investor. The Saudi-backed Savvy Games, who pulled out of a $2 billion partnership with Embracer Group in mid-2023. The cuts then followed thereafter. It's tough for me to say just how bad the damage actually is, but the rather sweeping changes at Embracer suggests to me that this was not a mere cynical calculation. The layoffs were a forced play. It's a larger cut than would be optimal in this situation for Embracer. Take two, on the other hand, is a little hard to place. I think they're a category one, and I think that this is demonstrably the case because they're dancing to their own tune. They know the steps, but aren't dancing to the same rhythm as Microsoft or Alphabet, which tells me that they know what they're doing, including the cynical part of laying off redundant staff to capitalize on investor sentiment. Consider the timing of everything. In May of 2023, at the steepest part of the trough, Take-Two acquired Zynga for $12.7 billion. Zynga shareholders received $3.50 in cash and 0 .0406 shares of Take-Two common stock as per the deal. As everyone else is cutting, Take-Two is hyping. This is because hype cycles are not industry-wide. They can feel industry-wide because the gravity of Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Apple, and more, all moving at the same time in, let's say, January of 2023, influences a lot of smaller players to copy without thinking. And it is such a movement of capital and resources that it has a sort of gravitational pull of its own. The whole market gets pulled along with the decision-making of these massive players. But if you are yourself a big enough player, you don't necessarily have to follow the tides because you yourself have a gravitational pull. Take Two is just such an example. It hyped into May. It made its cuts largely in September, and despite the acquisition of Zynga, it's still sitting on $1 billion in cash as per its November 2023 investor report. It's gearing up investors for its own next hype cycle by announcing GTA 6 when it did. Take Two knows exactly what it's doing, even if it doesn't seem to follow everyone else's pattern. The excess hires and then the layoffs and cuts and minor restructuring is just a part of the tango. None of it was strictly necessary, but it shores investor confidence, and this is textbook business cynicism. Now, I imagine this might be getting a little bit tedious, so we'll do just one more example. Ubisoft is a particularly cynical player, though not quite as good at the game as EA or Microsoft. According to Ubisoft's six-month report, its net bookings are up 17.6% year over year, its digital revenues up 12%, its player recurring investment up 22%, and its back catalog net bookings are up 37% year over year. It's been a great half year. Why so many layoffs then, Ubisoft? If your current teams and their current employees are producing excellent above anticipated results, what's the firing for? This is the same story, no surprises here. Despite record profits and industry growth, Ubisoft makes the cut because that's what investors expect to see and it makes them look responsible. Oh, but there are hard times coming from Ubisoft, and these cuts are warranted, and we're going to see a big retraction in video games, and... Just you watch. Check back in two years or so, give or take, when Ubisoft has reported 10-15% to year-over-year -year revenue growth once again and has been hiring in mass and is preparing an acquisition. Ubisoft has danced very well. Unless they slip up terribly, we will discover from the financial side that the excessive hirings during the peak time and the excessive layoffs during the trough time weren't at all necessary. It's just how the game is played, to the detriment of the average worker. I think we've gone through enough individual examples, you get the picture. I'll talk a bit about Sony and Sega in the next section of the video, but I want to conclude this section by talking media layoffs and gaming adjacent layoffs. Games media and video game storefronts, both digital and physical, don't really work the same as the larger video games industry. These are separate industries with far narrower margins and different business dynamics. Consider for example Humble Games, which had some layoffs on November 15th of 2023. Humble Games stated via a representative that, like many companies this year, we have experienced trends that required this restructure in order to ensure our long-term success. 
I like Humble Games. I like the charity work that they do. I like the people there. I like that they represent indie games and give a platform for game developers to distribute their work. I respect them a lot. But let me ask you, who is Humble Games exactly? Who owns Humble Bundle Incorporated? Well, Humble Bundle Incorporated was purchased in October of 2017 by IGN. Yes, that IGN. And IGN is a subsidiary of Ziff Davis, a much larger digital media company of around 5,000 employees and a reported revenue of $1.4 billion. In fact, they're based right here in good old New York City. How you doing, fellas? The ebb and flow hype cycle push and pull of big tech doesn't necessarily apply to media companies. Where the big game devs like EA and Ubisoft saw massive success this year and conducted layoffs in spite of that success, Ziff Davis saw its quarter 3 2023 revenues decrease by 0.3% compared to quarter 3 of 2022. As such, despite the fact that Ziff Davis is a large company, I don't think that the layoffs at Humble are necessarily coming from the same cynical place that the other games industry layoffs are coming from. Just because a company is big and tech-related doesn't mean it is necessarily following the strategies we've discussed. Humble and publishers like it, as well as many digital media companies, are almost all going to be Category 3. They are not playing the same game as the big tech wannabes. Well, at least not always. But that's a video for another time, perhaps. As we conclude our examples, it's now time to talk about potential areas of skepticism. Okay, Mooney, I can hear you say I've been dying for this part of the video because I have so many complaints and I'm so skeptical. I mean, if EA and Microsoft and Ubisoft and Humble and Take-Two and all of these indie studios are all cutting staff, isn't this just market forces in action? Sure, the video games industry is reporting record profits. Sure, the investor reports reviewed are showing excellent revenue. But there was excess hiring due to COVID market enthusiasm, and there is a pullback from those highs because these companies foresee a shift in the market. Okay, okay, well, fair point. Are all these layoffs really just cynical corporate decision making, or is this just the market cycle in action? Well, I hope so far that the video has shown you that it's kind of both. That the corporate big tech strategy is how you push into the cycle, into the market conditions, so that you can overswing on the top and cut towards the bottom. Doing so in order to maximize investor capital inflow and minimize outflow. Examples like Take Two show you that you can even generate your own hype cycles that aren't necessarily synchronized with the market at large. But even though Take Two didn't time its layoffs with everybody else, they still went with the layoffs, right? The success of hiring and firing is just the market playing tricks on everyone. Isn't that how this all works? Well, here is something to consider. When all of these layoffs were happening, while subsidiary studios were being closed and absorbed and people were being moved around and reorganized and surplus staff hired during boom times were being cynically fired, there was a massive player in the video games industry that didn't lay anyone off. In fact, not only did this big player not do any layoffs, but in quarter one of 2023, when the big tech strategy players were conducting their mass layoffs, despite strong revenue, this company increased its employees' wages by 10%, even during a reported revenue slump. This company is an example of the old way of doing things in the video games industry. Of corporate governance in an industry once run by idealistic game developers and engineers instead of cynical big tech finance people. The company I am referring to is Nintendo. I'm going to read an excerpt for you out of an investor Q&A. Take a look at the dynamics at play here. Look carefully at what the investor asks and see what investors expect. You will notice the investors expect the big tech game plan. And then pay close attention and see what Nintendo's answer is to that question. Here we go. Question 16. This fiscal year, you announced an increase in employee base salary in Japan, and I think that this is a very positive initiative in retaining talented employees. On the other hand, increasing employee base salary decreases the resources for dividends. So I can imagine there was some sort of negative feedback from institutional investors. Please describe the reactions from institutional investors, employees, and other companies in the industry regarding this wage increase. To which Nintendo President Furukawa responds, I believe the most important factor in maintaining our high level of competitiveness is to value the employees that have created various popular products and built the brand. 
Currently, we are experiencing unprecedented levels of global inflation, and in Japan, we understand that people are facing increasing financial pressure in their daily lives. For this reason, to deal with long-term and continuing changes in the environment, Nintendo increased the base salary for all employees in Japan by 10%, separate from the annual wage increase. There it is. While the other companies say there is inflation and rising interest rates, which is why we have to cut employees. Nintendo doesn't make the excessive hires, and Nintendo doesn't fire anyone as a show to investors because Nintendo's business strategy, its corporate governance, its game plan isn't copycatted nor cynically built. It is truly old school. Nintendo has its copycats too, and in fact the Japanese video games industry tends to prefer to copy Nintendo's strategy because it has worked so well for the company. For shareholders, well, uh, maybe a little less so. There's a substantial divide in how Sony of America, for example, handles their affairs compared to Sony of Japan. Sony of America acts like an American tech company. The Sony in Japan is sometimes a little Japanese, sometimes also a little American. Sega is the same way. We've seen Sega handle its American possessions like an American tech company. I didn't have time in this video to discuss shoddy game releases and how that fits into this equation. But consider what's going on with Creative Assembly on the one hand, and on the other hand, look at Atlas, which recently raised its employees' salaries by 15%, or Square Enix, which raised its salaries by 10% this year. Okay, but isn't it hard to fire employees in Japan? Isn't this just a quirk of Japanese economics? Isn't it more difficult to find employees in Japan right now, which is why employers are focusing on higher salaries to retain employees? Well, yes, it is definitely harder to fire employees in Japan, but it's doable, and oftentimes such downsizing is done via suggestion. In March of 2023, when big tech was conducting its layoffs, Japanese workers weren't spared. Google went about the execution of its hype cycle game plan by offering early resignation, for example. In November of 2022, despite the legal consequences of ad hoc layoffs in Japan, firing from the hip, if you will, Elon Musk of Twitter fired numerous staff from Twitter Japan in furtherance of his own corporate game plan. So absolutely, layoffs can be done and they are done. Is the Japanese economy special in some way? Maybe the job market is extra hot, unemployment is extra low, and as such it makes no sense to be firing right now. Maybe that's why Sega and Sony handle their American affairs so differently than they handle their Japanese affairs right? Well, yes, Japan's unemployment rate is especially low and it has a hot labor market. But uh, so does most of the Western world, especially in the United States. If one were to merely look at the job market in a vacuum, it would make no sense at all for American companies to be conducting layoffs right now either. And yes, though Sony and Sega handle their American subsidiaries and affairs in the styles that their American big tech-influenced leadership prefers, Nintendo, notably, does not. Doug Bowser, current president of Nintendo of America, was recently quoted as saying that Nintendo doesn't have labor unions because their job satisfaction is so high. Now that might seem like a farcical statement to you, but anyone who speaks corporate lingo knows that you always want to avoid the U word. Even the mere mention of unions is a terrifying prospect. But Bowser is willing to say, look, our people are so happy that we aren't even scared to talk about unions openly. And indeed, Nintendo of America, much like Nintendo of Japan proper, hasn't engaged in the cynical layoffs that we've seen emerge from the rest of the industry. As an important caveat, let me make this perfectly clear. A very defensive old-school mentality to leadership like Nintendo's has its good and bad. One of the reasons Nintendo is so defensive with its intellectual property, for example, is this old-school mentality. Uh, there's a give and take. I'm also not suggesting that Nintendo never lays anyone off, or that all layoffs at companies like Microsoft and EA are these cynical, carefully engineered corporate decisions. No, very often the cynicism is reactive, not proactive. And as for Nintendo and companies like Nintendo, well, they prove that excess hiring and shocking layoffs aren't a necessity. That if it wasn't for a very specific corporate strategy that copies very recent developments in big tech, the logical and reasonable decision here would be to hire the right amount of staff and work to retain them during a hot job market. It's important for me to note that Nintendo and the Nintendo game plan copycats do also have to manage hype. They use hype to sell their products and they participate in the cycle to some extent. But they are not beholden to hype because they are not selling hype for the purposes of hooking investors. And as such, their engagement with the hype needed to be so cynical. Nintendo doesn't have to engage in this over-hiring during the boom and firing or reorganizing during the bust because its corporate leadership feels that a more stable, consistent pattern of growth that doesn't rely on a critical mass of investor capital 
has served it well so far and the boat shouldn't be rocked. The consequence of not participating in this hype cycle and of not operating like an American big tech company is that Nintendo, despite owning some of the world's most valuable intellectual properties and brands, has a relatively modest $54.11 billion market cap, while EA, a company without nearly the brands or provenance and ranked the fifth most hated company in the US by USA Today in 2018, has a market cap of roughly $36.61 billion. You can also consider Roblox, which in 2021 had a market cap of $59.71 billion, higher than Nintendo is today. And their intellectual property consists of, well, Roblox. But of course, Nintendo's investors understand that this is the way Nintendo plays the game, and that Nintendo is still around and still great, precisely because it doesn't engage in the cynical practices that have otherwise consumed the video games industry. Andrea Saravia Perez, a former Firaxis narrative designer, states that 2022 was probably the best year to break into games. 2023, many agree, is worse than 2009. But the circumstances surrounding the layoffs in 2023 do not look anything like 2009. The video games industry is booming. The job market is extremely hot. Companies are reporting record profits and sales, and yet here we are cutting jobs. I am deeply sorry to all of the game devs and industry people out there who have been affected by these layoffs and the many others who live in constant anxiety of being next, many of whom I know are watching this very video. I'm sorry that it's happened like this, because the video games industry is not facing the Great Recession right now. Quite the opposite is true, we've seen record numbers and record growth reported directly to investors and distributed to shareholders via stock buybacks and dividends. These firings and studio closures and all this belt tightening, all of this suffering, comes from a particular style of cynical corporate governance that has escaped the containment of big tech and infected the video games industry writ large. The industry isn't about to collapse, far from it. This isn't the end of the industry, it's just good business. Not to bite the hand that feeds, but I want you to read an excerpt from a blog post written by an ex-Google employee. Hixey joined Google in October of 2005 and resigned on November 20th of 2023, just a week or so prior to the publishing of this video. This former employee writes about how the oft-mocked don't be evil slogan was once truly a guiding principle of Google. Executives at early Google gave frank answers on a weekly basis. Eric Schmidt regularly walked the whole company through the discussions of the board. The company had a vision and deviations from that vision were always explained. Google seldom, if ever, saw layoffs at all. But at some point, Google went from tech company to big tech company, and I'd argue even beyond that. Big tech has completed its transformation in recent years, and most if not all of these companies have moved from proactive leadership with idealistic vision to an increasingly reactive leadership built upon cynical response to shareholder and investor sentiment. Big tech has become like finance, and video game companies are following that same suit. If you were one of the employees affected by these cynical layoffs or closures, I want you to know that it's not you. It's almost certainly not your fault, and when the hype cycle turns around, if you're still interested in working in the industry, there will be a hiring boom and everyone will play musical chairs, and you may find yourself with a new job at a different company until the cycle turns again. Hixie, the ex-Googler, writes concerning Google that it's Definitely not too late to heal Google. It would require some shakeup at the top of the company, moving the center of power from the CFO's office back to someone with a clear long-term vision for how to use Google's extensive resources. If you are a decision maker at your company, whether you're the head of a small indie studio or a board member of a multinational corporation, I hope that you will consider the human cost of your decisions and choose a more humane way of doing business. But who are we kidding? I've met a heck of a lot of finance people and business types and startup goblins and whatnot, and I already know that most of you won't. You won't. You just won't. I hope you, whoever you are, will be the exception to that rule. As for you workers, you employees. Well, Doug Bowser says that Nintendo is such a nice company to work for that their employees don't even consider unionizing. But how about you? How does your company treat you? I wonder. I've been your host, Mooney, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel.